colleague, and I also have to say a friend of mine from the University of Graz in Austria, uh, Christian, Professor Christian Fleck. Um, Christian is interested in the history of sociology and many other things. Uh, made his name by particularly focusing his earlier part of his career on Karl Lasersfeld and the study of the uh, unemployed in Marienthal. Uh, I've done various other books uh, and uh, more recently uh, The Transatlantic History of the Social Sciences, which appeared in 2007, first in German with Surkamp, a good publisher, as you probably might know, and uh, now a couple of years later uh, in translation with Bloomsbury. Uh, nice to see that uh, the millions that came out from uh, Harry Potter books are being put to some use, <laughs> and they have now an academic branch, so good news for us, I guess. Um, Christian, in the last couple of years, uh, he did his research uh, partly in the United States, uh, spent some time in the Rockefeller archives, and also uh, had a prestigious fellowship at the New York Public Library in New York, was also a fellow at Harvard, and uh, more recently had a Fulbright professorship in uh, the University of Minnesota. And uh, today we will talk about, I guess, the book. Uh, it's from the subtitle, take from the subtitle, Robert Barron's The Third Reich and the Invention of Empirical Social Research. And please, the floor is yours. Hi. Okay. Yeah. Uh, many thanks uh, for coming. Uh, thanks for inviting me. But I want to do is to give you uh, not, not a complete uh, overview of the book, it's, it's uh, two lines. Uh, but uh, I will talk about some of the background ideas uh, which help me to develop the ideas in this study. Uh, the uh, title of the, today's talk is uh, taken from. No. The title is talking from, from the subtitle of the book, uh, which uh, got the title, which is a little bit different from the German title. Uh, and my idea when I thought about the German title was uh, to use an American expression, uh, transatlantic enrichment. Uh, but the people from Bloomsbury didn't want this uh, simple uh, title, so they decided to take a much broader one. Uh, it, the book isn't a transatlantic uh, history uh, of, of uh, social sciences or uh, uh, sociology in particular, uh, but only uh, of, of uh, one or two uh, streams uh, or sides uh, of these uh, particular transatlantic uh, exchanges from the 1930s to the 1950s. Uh, and the, uh, hopefully, and I'm, I'm really pleased uh, that uh, the people at Bloomsbury uh, accepted my suggestion for the uh, title of the book. Uh, you can see it here a little bit uh, enlarged. Uh, this is a picture by uh, the more yeah, the famous painter Avi Kittal, uh, which is called Cecil Kordlam WC2, The Refugees. Uh, and uh, some of you may know that uh, Kitai uh, is used or was used uh, to uh, make comments to some of his uh, sorry uh, to some of his uh, paintings and, and this particular painting uh, he explained with uh, a lengthy explanation I don't want to, to read the whole uh, but uh, you see that uh, uh, he uh, starts to talking about history in the second line of his among some of other things, I think I have a lot of experience of refugees from the Germans, and that's how this painting came about. My dad and grandmother Kitai and quite a few people dear to me just barely escaped. Uh, and then there are some uh, additional uh, remarks to uh, the Yiddish theater, which is uh, from the East Central European uh, culture coming to, to, to London. Uh, and uh, these refugee uh, uh, built one of uh, the main groups uh, I'm talking about in this book uh, and I will partly talk uh, on them uh, today. So, uh, Kitai's uh, remarks uh, offer uh, something in addition uh, because uh, he made uh, the, the reference that uh, 
uh, he did have some experience with refugees uh, from the Germans. Uh, uh, and uh, if you go to uh, the biography of uh, Abi Kitai, then you will see that uh, his uh, father, uh, a man by the name Sigmund Benway, uh, was born in Hungary, but left the family uh, at a very early age. So nearly after Kita was born in uh, 1932, uh, and his mother he married then, uh, and his uh, stepfather was uh, a research chemist uh, by the name Walter Kittai. Uh, he took the name of his stepfather, uh, and this is uh, why uh, he uh, refers to, uh, to this uh, refugee experience. It was the family of his uh, stepfather. Uh, but why then Germans? Uh, uh, in, in these remarks uh, by Kittai, uh, a man from Hungary, uh, another man from Vienna, uh, and uh, some grandmother probably from some eastern part of the Austrian-Hungarian uh, Empire. Uh, and this is one, one of the uh, points uh, I will uh, explain uh, in these uh, remarks of the book. Uh, in before, uh, for several uh, obvious reasons, <laughs> I will just make one reference, uh, one short reference uh, to one of uh, local heroes uh, here. <laughs> uh, in, uh, Elias, well, Elias, as we Germans say, uh, famous, uh, what is sociology? Uh, Elias calls us uh, all scientists, not only sociologists, not only social scientists, all scientists, to destroy mess. Uh, and the German expression is even stronger. We have to hunt uh, mm. for uh, myths, uh, which is much more okay, than... The mistranslation is an eye for I don't want to blame you for uh, <coughs> uh, the translation, but uh, what, uh, one of my, the backgrounds uh, of, of my own study was uh, to uh, hunt for some of uh, the myths uh, related uh, to this particular period uh, in the history of the social sciences, sociology in particular. Uh, there are several uh, myths uh, around uh, with uh, regard to the uh, refugee scholars, uh, the migration process, the forced migration, uh, with regard to the development of empirical social research in this particular period. Uh, and uh, that's what uh, my uh, book is about. So, uh, Myth uh, number one uh, goes a little bit back in, in history in the years before uh, the Nazi movement took over power. So in the 1920s, that, that there was still uh, uh, an idea uh, governed uh, most of the German uh, academics that their own academic system, the German academic system, is uh, superior to all the other. <laughs> university systems worldwide. Uh, and uh, that's number one. Uh, number two is uh, taken from the uh, subtitle of the Robert Behrens. Uh, I will uh, explain immediately what the Robert Behrens are. Uh, the third point I mentioned in before is uh, this, uh, what does it mean uh, to, to talk about Germans with regard uh, to this uh, migration population. The fourth uh, is then the influence uh, or the consequences uh, of these uh, refugees, uh, refugee scholars uh, to the main uh, receiving country, the United States. Uh, and there are some uh, German speaking uh, commentators, also historians, who really speak of a culture mission, which means uh, they brought particular things with them uh, to uh, this. Uh, yeah, uneducated, uncivilized uh, uh, American culture and de-provincialized uh, then American academic world. And uh, the fifth point, I don't I will have time enough uh, to uh, talk about, is uh, this uh, famous topic of, of positivism uh, in uh, sociology, uh, which is mostly uh, connected to its supposed American uh, rules, and I will uh, talk a little bit of this uh, again. So, uh, let's 
switch to the first uh, the supposed uh, superiority of the German universities. Uh, of course, uh, there, there are some uh, aspects of the German system uh, which goes back to this uh, creation of the uh, university in, in, in Berlin uh, and the uh, reform movement uh, which is connected with the name of uh, Humboldt. Uh, which functioned uh, in several other countries as a model. Uh, so, most famously uh, in the US, uh, where this uh, Johns Hopkins University was modeled uh, along the lines of uh, the German system. Even uh, in, in neighboring uh, France, uh, they took some ideas uh, of these German university systems into their own system. Uh, and probably even in, in, in Great Britain, there was uh, some influence with the development of the idea of kind of seminars, discussion groups, uh, uh, as a kind of uh, style of learning, style of teaching. Uh, so the main idea of this uh, Humboldtian uh, reform uh, was the unity of research and instruction. So students weren't any longer uh, just take. Uh, Notes, uh, and people who have to learn particular uh, sentences out of uh, holy books, uh, but had to do their own uh, first steps of research. Uh, and this model uh, bent over uh, all uh, yeah, universities nowadays. Uh, secondly, uh, my second point is uh, the superiority of the German system uh, attracted a lot of uh, foreign students. Uh, in particular in the late uh, 19th century and the early 20th century, so roughly before World War I, uh, a lot of uh, American students got even their PhDs uh, in German universities and went then back uh, to the US uh, to take over professorships uh, in the American system. Uh, and some, some of these uh, exchange students even uh, came after World War I uh, to Germany, but uh, it was declining around uh, the first uh, Great War and not uh, just uh, in the 1930s. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, as an uh, indication of this uh, superiority of the German system, if you look at the Nobel Prize, so just in medicine, uh, chemistry and physics, uh, so the, the science prizes. Uh, in this uh, first peri uh, period up to the 1940s, uh, the Germans got uh, the highest number uh, of, of prizes, much before, a little bit before the UK, much before France, uh, and uh, the double number of, of the Americans. Uh, so uh, if you, uh, what would have been uh, correct for several reasons, include the Austrians to the Germans uh, as part of this larger uh, German-speaking universe, uh, uh, then uh, the difference would be uh, even larger, and the rest of the world, so to speak, uh, got, got some 30 uh, prices. Uh, so, uh, that's true uh, on the one side, uh, that there is some uh, superiority, but uh, there are countervailing uh, movements, uh, and one of the strongest uh, uh, indication is the development of the number of students uh, in these particular areas. And what you see here is uh, the, this line is the US, uh, the second line is uh, Germany, and uh, Austria doesn't play any role. Uh, and this is between uh, 1880 and 1960. So uh, over 80 years, uh, the number of students in higher education increased in the U.S. dramatically. And if you look uh, closer on these, you can say in the late 1920s, early 1930s, the American university and higher education and uh, research system expanded dramatically uh, and created uh, what, what is called now a, a, a mass uh, uh, education system. And all the other countries, uh, and if you would uh, include other uh, countries like, like the UK, for example, uh, the lines would be nearly similar to, uh, to the Austrian. Uh, so, uh, 
system where most other uh, countries uh, were in a, in a stable, not expanding uh, system up to the 1960s, uh, and the Americans started uh, and uh, starting an expanding system that needs uh, additional teachers, additional researchers, additional professors. Uh, and what I uh, try to show in, uh, in, in some details uh, in, in this book uh, is uh, that most of these refugees which came to the US uh, after 1933 and in particular in the late 1930s uh, after uh, the Germans took over Austria uh, and uh, the, the, the so-called Reichskristallnacht forced out nearly all Jews uh, from Germany. Uh, they got after a relatively short period of adaptation uh, relatively uh, good jobs uh, in the US system. But uh, the American system not only uh, was uh, open to incoming uh, academics, uh, it produced uh, in this same period of the first third of the 20th century some institutional uh, reforms, uh, developments, uh, and modifications. Uh, which influenced uh, what we now understand as a uh, uh, university and I learned uh, this, this day uh, that even your university is now thinking about reformulating the titles uh, of the academics. Uh, titles are usually an indication of uh, uh, developments uh, more, more deeper uh, and one of the uh, strongest influence which came from, from the US uh, was the establishment of a department uh, as a unit uh, of gaining recognition, uh, managing uh, scholarship uh, and teaching uh, and uh, this uh, spread over to the rest of the world uh, and is now more or less, even if it uh, sometimes is called different. Uh, the second uh, innovation from, from the US uh, is the sabbatical, uh, freeing people from uh, their usual obligations for a particular time uh, and uh, uh, having some, some uh, security to get this. Uh, a third point is uh, today everyone knows what a project is. Uh, 30 years ago, uh, only a minority knew it, and uh, 80 years before, uh, people like, for example, uh, Norbert Elias or Max Weber never would have thought uh, along the lines of projects. Yeah? Things uh, you have to do within a uh, very short period of time and submitting uh, a final report afterwards. Uh, so, not all of these developments are good uh, in their intrinsic uh, values, but they are formed uh, the development of uh, what we now have uh, to uh, handle uh, as our environment. Uh, other uh, innovations from the US are the relatively early establishment of professional associations which are functioning uh, as a forum to establish uh, scientific disciplines uh, which uh, happened in, in, in the US for the social sciences much earlier than anything else uh, and uh, the specialized journals uh, came into existence in the US much earlier than, than uh, somewhere else. According uh, to this uh, innovation, uh, the publication routines uh, changed, uh, so we had, oh, our fathers had to learn uh, to write uh, an art, journal article uh, according to particular expectations uh, of journal publishers. Uh, which wasn't in existence uh, when, when in the 1920s uh, uh, people in, in, in Germany, for example, published their thesis. So if you go back to this Archiv für Sozialwissenschaft und Sozialpolitik, the leading German uh, journal of this time, uh, you don't find any particular article which fits, which would fit into a, a, a present day journal. Yeah? They are much too long, there is no uh, by bibliography, there are no footnotes, there are no hypotheses, uh, nothing uh, which we need today. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, in, in, in the US, there, there was uh, established a regime of, of funding, 
uh, and this brings me uh, to the rubber barons. Uh, the rubber barons is, is an uh, ironic uh, title, a fighting title for particular industrialists uh, of the late 19th century and the early 20th century, uh, and some of them uh, became very famous in their early years uh, as uh, yeah, uh, brutal uh, exploiters uh, of uh, the proletariat uh, as people who established uh, rich firms uh, in gas, uh, steel, and uh, other things. But most of them are nowadays remembered uh, because there is a Carnegie Hall uh, in the middle of Manhattan, uh, there are Carnegie libraries, uh, and even the Rockefellers uh, nowadays uh, much more uh, uh, remembered because there are Rockefeller centers for arts uh, and they established philanthropies uh, in the early 20th century uh, and lost therefore their original uh, uh, Robert Barron's titles uh, uh, established uh, a legacy uh, beyond. Uh, and that there are several others uh, which are not so famous. Uh, for example, this Mrs. Sage, uh, the founder of the Russell Sage Foundation, which was the, uh, and is still the strongest social science funding uh, foundation. These uh, foundations uh, established in themselves a kind of scientific philanthropy. So they needed uh, people uh, working in the foundations to establish how to uh, give away uh, this uh, huge amount of money. Uh, and the development of the personnel in the foundations is an interesting piece in itself. Uh, as, an, uh, as you can see here, uh, it's not so uh, the details. Uh, both Carnegie and uh, Rockefeller established different uh, branches of their foundations. Uh, and the most uh, relevant uh, foundation became the Rockefeller Foundation. Uh, the, the size uh, indicates the amount of money which was uh, in it. Uh, the Carnegie Corporation was established in 1910, uh, and uh, the Laura Spanman, uh, the Laura Spanman uh, was the first big uh, uh, founding agency for the social society. So. Uh, the so-called Chicago School became the money from this Robert Spellman uh, Rockefeller Memorial, which later on was, was uh, <coughs> organized into the uh, Rockefeller Foundation uh, themselves. Uh, these uh, philanthropies uh, established uh, this uh, system of uh, funding for particular periods of time and supported this uh, earlier mentioned project orientation. Uh, because they uh, did uh, want to have some uh, accountancy uh, with regard uh, to their money and they need to report to their superiors uh, and so on and so forth. So a small digression, what do these uh, Robert parents are there any similarities? Uh, are there any, any similarities? We do know that uh, the uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is now the biggest foundation worldwide and even in history. So it uh, has much more money than, than uh, both Carnegie and uh, Rockefeller together. But what uh, do they, they uh, fund? Uh, uh, their, their funding uh, orientation is completely different. Uh, they don't put money into the development of the social sciences because uh, back in the 1920s, they uh, people in this foundation expected something from the social sciences uh, to help reform uh, the development of uh, our societies and uh, things like this. Uh, establishing a more realistic uh, approach uh, and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, all the other uh, rich people from today don't get uh, titles like Robert Barons because they, they don't exploit uh, any, any workers any longer. They now exploit consumers, and consumers don't react similarly uh, to trade union movements. Uh, but this is just a digression. Uh, we'll see that uh, sometimes uh, you can even get some ideas for present day analysis by going back in history. Uh, so, 
Äh, Gott geht äh, das Wort Reich, der Führer in den Nazis, äh, du, äh, du diese Development. Äh, and now I, 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 I'm coming to a point which is a little bit difficult to, uh, to, to uh, propose, because I'm coming from Austria, and Austria is uh, to Germany as Ireland to the UK, uh, so there are small brothers uh, of a big neighbor, uh, and usually we have to defend ourselves against these big neighbors. Uh, but uh, at this moment, uh, I'm not in this business, uh, but uh, I'm just interested in, in, in comparative study uh, with regard to these two uh, uh, neighboring countries uh, having the same language. Uh, and in particular, I'm interested uh, in the different sizes of what is called uh, the educated middle class in, in translation or the Bildungsbürgertum, those with an academic uh, educational background. And if you take uh, as a starting point the relation uh, between uh, the people in Germany and Austria as 10 to 100, uh, then you find some interesting uh, relations if you compare different uh, branches uh, which are more interesting uh, to our idea. So, uh, students uh, in the 1920s, 1930s, uh, in Austria did have much more students compared uh, to this uh, 1 to 10. Uh, it produced four times as much uh, Rockefeller Fellows. So the Rockefeller Foundation gave money to young promising men at this time mostly, only very few women, uh, to spend one or two years or even three years abroad uh, just to broaden their, their perspectives uh, and returning to their home base uh, afterwards. Uh, and, uh, one, 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 the two chapters of the book are uh, comparing these uh, procedures, selecting uh, fellows in uh, different European countries uh, and looking uh, at the outcomes of the fellows. Uh, and uh, Vienna, Austria in this time means always Vienna. Yeah? Uh, Vienna was <coughs> a much more a productive place than uh, whole Germany. Uh, and if you look at this educated media, it, it, it's a little bit different, uh, difficult to, to uh, measure uh, people uh, with regard to so small uh, sizes. But there are good indications that the educated middle class was uh, in Austria and Vienna larger compared to Germany. And this uh, contributed uh, together with, with a uh, larger size of the higher education system to a, a higher number of dismissed people uh, in the, during the 1930s uh, when first the dictatorship happened in Austria and then the Nazis took over power. <coughs> uh, so more people had to uh, leave uh, their home base from Austria than from Germany. Uh, but uh, landing in the US only a few Austrians need help from one of these established refugee help organizations. There was one in London, there was another one in, in New York, and if you go to the uh, archive and uh, look at uh, who got uh, supported, uh, who got uh, support from, from this uh, emergency committee in New York, uh, less uh, Austrians than the Germans uh, were in need. Uh, so the Germans uh, did have uh, some, some uh, expectations for particular reasons uh, to get uh, more uh, support uh, when they had to re-establish themselves in uh, the US. So my suggestion or my consequence is not to speak of German uh, refugees, but of German speaking, but it's a little bit uh, ridiculous to get to say German speaking. Uh, the one point, uh, with regard to the expectations uh, of these refugees is here uh, a simple comparison of academic income. Uh, for Austria, Germany, the UK and the US, uh, in, according to two uh, lines, the first uh, line is the ratio of annual salaries of academics, uh, the lowest to the highest. Uh, if you look at the US, it was a highly egalitarian university system. Yeah. Uh, make a calculation for today. Yeah. Then you see it. Your president to the lowest lecturer. Yeah. Uh, 
would be uh, like technically different from 1 to 6, 1 to 8. Uh, but Germany and Austria have been highly uh, uh, dispersed and uh, inequal uh, in academic income in the 1920s and 1930s. Uh, so a German uh, professor was uh, uh, got a higher income than a German minister uh, in the federal ministry system. Uh, it's unimaginable uh, and I, I went through and defined what it was because I couldn't uh, uh, accept it at the first time. And even if you compare it uh, to the GNP per capita, uh, you see uh, that uh, the highest ranking German professors got 55 times as much as uh, the average GNP per capita. So, uh, if someone out of this system uh, becomes for uh, reasons uh, he, uh, don't have any influence uh, on it, a refugee uh, landing in New York, uh, he or she, some very seldom she, uh, was expecting uh, to lose a little bit of income, yeah, but not lose uh, 50 times uh, of their income. Uh, and this explains partly uh, the higher uh, Troubles uh, uh, for, for German uh, refugees to re-establish themselves uh, in, in, in the U.S. Uh, and uh, there is another. Uh, sorry, this was the wrong. Here, uh, there, there is another analysis in the book uh, which uses this correspondence analysis. Uh, uh, it's probably a little bit too difficult to explain it in, in, in two sentences. Uh, but it's relatively simple. To, uh, you can see differences. Uh, this is the dot for the Austrians who are not uh, Jewish, but refugees. So uh, it's only a comparison of refugee Germans. Here are the Austrian Jews, uh, here the German Jews, and here the German non-Jewish refugees. Uh, and in uh, this kind of analysis, if dots are uh, more far away from each other, then they are more uh, unequal, more dissimilar than others. So what you can see is, uh, you have on the one side both Austrian groups and the other side both German groups. Uh, uh, with regard to all the other uh, variables uh, which uh, have been included in this analysis. Uh, and the most uh, telling are the Germans went back much more to a much higher degree uh, than the Austrians, uh, whereas the Austrians have been uh, in need of uh, receiving a second or even a third degree abroad. So they restudied in the US, which uh, made it much easier for them to re-establish themselves or even get their first uh, establishment. So for example, Peter Blau uh, is one of the leading American uh, sociologists of the uh, late 20th century. He was born in Vienna uh, and came to the US uh, uh, as a young student uh, and got his PhD at Columbia and several others uh, which could be mentioned uh, to, to uh, give some uh, names for this. Uh, I don't want to go into the, the details of this. Uh, with regard to the uh, so-called culture mission, uh, there is usually uh, a proposition that the Germans brought continental philosophical thinking to the US, uh, which uh, is more or less correct. Uh, one of these refugee scholars, uh, Lukosa, uh, uh, invented this idea of this deprovincialization. Uh, with regard to the UK, uh, Barry Anderson uh, in, in an article she published in the 1960s, claimed that the so uh, he called them white emigres, which is the distinction of red and white in the Russian Revolution uh, and afterwards, and the white emigres uh, invaded Britain and uh, he <coughs> claims that they destroyed uh, good British Marxism and so, uh, in particular good British uh, socialism, uh, and he called some of the uh, devils uh, Isaiah Berlin Wittgenstein, uh, which is funny because Wittgenstein did have some ideas for uh, social philosophy, but uh, 
uh, never mentioned it uh, in public, uh, Popper Company, uh, Hayek in particular. Uh, and Anne Bloom, uh, one, one of the Chicago uh, professors, uh, claimed that the refugees brought relativism to the US. So, uh, what you can see is a very diverse picture what the refugees uh, did have uh, on influence. Uh, and uh, even some mentioned that positivism came, came to the US. Uh, if you look uh, from a point of uh, reception analysis uh, to what uh, in uh, a sample of more than 100 uh, social science journals uh, have been uh, established as, as the base for, for measuring recognition, uh, you find these uh, 20 names uh, of uh, German-speaking social scientists. Uh, I don't want to claim that uh, a particular place in this table is, is, is correctly measured, so probably uh, Weber should be before Simmel or Weber even before Lazarfeld. Uh, that's not the point. But if you go down these uh, 20 names, some of them are completely unfamiliar even for experts. For example, this Christopher Dietze is a completely unknown uh, man from demography. Yeah? Uh, but inside demography, he did have a big influence. Uh, Jacob Morino uh, is now <coughs> gone. No one knows any longer Morino. Uh, but uh, he was very influential with his uh, sociometry in the 1930s. And he established nearly what is now his uh, Journal of uh, Social Psychology. Uh, as a journal for sociometry, and so on and so forth. Yeah? Uh, and some more well-known name, uh, uh, even uh, in, in lower ranks. Uh, but they don't fit uh, into any single picture. So you cannot say that uh, these are the positivists, because there is Freud on the list, and Simbel uh, uh, and, and others. Uh, so uh, my, my conclusion is, uh, for this influence uh, topic, uh, several of these Europeans brought different things. Some of them not even traveled as refugees to the US, like, like Weber, Simmel, and, and uh, Freud. Yeah? Uh, but they influenced uh, these courses uh, just by publishing and translating things, or sending over uh, uh, disciples uh, to spread their own message, which was the case uh, with Freud at least partly. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> three more minutes? No, yeah. Yeah. Five. Uh, Five. Okay. Uh, final point of this American positivism. There, there is, uh, well, there have been uh, several uh, remarks on the influence uh, of about uh, Theodore Adorno, uh, he himself a refugee for a while uh, in the US and labeled administrative research. Uh, and this uh, administrative research is the opposite to critical research. And critical research is, uh, as you can imagine, the good uh, version, and administrative is the bad one. Uh, and Adorno uh, brought some uh, years uh, in administrative research, and then uh, he went uh, out of it. And one, one of the chapters is on the, uh, Adorno's uh, collaboration uh, with Lazarsfeld in the radio research project in the 1930s and 1940s, uh, which is the base both for Adorno's uh, remarks on administrative research uh, and his claims on, on, on the bad sides of positivism. Uh, during this uh, uh, radio research, uh, Adorno came across this like and dislike methodology, which is true. They used like and dislike uh, with regard to particular radio programs, uh, advertisements, and things like this. Uh, but uh, the, uh, even in the, in the early days of this radio research, uh, some other uh, studies have been made uh, which uh, went much beyond this like dislike methodology. Uh, so, uh, uh, and uh, people like, like Adorno and others claimed that only one study of this possibility personality, which has been done in, in California, demonstrated this happy marriage between critical thinking on the one hand and uh, American whatever. Yeah? Uh, it's not so clear 
uh, was it American positive reason or and if you look in more details uh, into this uh, particular study uh, on the uh, 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 government, then you can see uh, that the American part was partly a European part because one of these uh, psychology collaborators uh, was Else Frenke. She was born in Galicia, uh, got the PhD uh, under the psychologist uh, Carl and Charlotte Bühler in, in, in Vienna and went abroad uh, with her husband uh, Egon Brunswick to California and she was one uh, of these uh, psychologists who brought this uh, scaling uh, methodology into uh, the Osmodern personality project. Uh, I don't want to go into more details uh, for, for this, uh, but just to summarize that uh, a lot of uh, yeah, average knowledge uh, on these uh, years of the 30s, 40s and 50s uh, is in particular in, in, in Germany or the German-speaking countries related to influential uh, remarks by particular people and uh, Adorno's remarks on these experiences uh, during his years in the US influenced uh, a whole generation of, of students from the 1960s uh, in, in Germany and uh, supported their idea uh, of these uh, American positivists. Uh, if you uh, look, for example, on uh, the books which tried to analyze uh, under the title of more or less totalitarianism uh, what was going on in particular uh, in, in, in Germany, so, nearly none, none of these uh, is on the other totalitarian uh, system. Uh, but you can see uh, a, a lot of these uh, more or less refugee scholars, not all of them have been refugees. So, uh, Hayek wasn't really a refugee, Schumpeter wasn't a refugee. Both went uh, abroad on ordinary professorships. But they both were at least uh, in opposition to the Nazis. Uh, and therefore uh, they were much more uh, associated with uh, the refugee culture, if you uh, like to call it this way. Uh, most of the others were more or less uh, refugees uh, in several places. Uh, and you see a lot of, in the lower lines, there are not so prominent people, but Ludwig Mises even uh, wrote a book where he proposed all this uh, neoliberalism uh, to the Nazis uh, as a case of omnipotent government. Uh, so not all these studies are uh, worth reading, uh, but they uh, can, can uh, give you an idea uh, what was uh, concerning people who went abroad or studied abroad with uh, a background in uh, Central Europe, uh, a background in German philosophy, German uh, social sciences. So, not even not, uh, some of the 1968 uh, people claimed that all these refugees uh, became depoliticized and uh, lost their political affiliations or joined these white uh, uh, counter revolution uh, wing uh, in uh, the cultural history is correct. So, uh, what I try to do in this book uh, is uh, to uh, demystify some, some of these uh, myths uh, and, yeah, this was just a kind of introduction to the book. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, so we've got time for discussion. I'll just switch on the light and we can see each other. Any questions or remarks, comments? Okay. It's very interesting talking, and uh, I was always puzzled by this kind of uh, link between North American academia and German academia. And I know there are links, you know, going back all the way to the 19th century. But what's also interesting for me to see the kind of uh, link on the other side: how American scholars went to Germany, you know, the Chicago School of Art, and Parsons, and many others were influenced directly by German kind of uh, education system in, in Germany itself. 
And on the other side, it's also interesting for me, uh, in a broader sense, uh, how uh, uh, American foreign policy was shaped very much by German academic thinking, and particularly geopolitics, and Razzo, who has made influence, <coughs> and still does, I think, most of the neocons draw on many of these ideas, you know, the late 19th century. Uh, so can you tell me a little bit more, or ask a little bit more about this uh, relationship, focusing on the Germany as much? Yes. Uh, of, of course, uh, Henry Kissinger was born in, in uh, near Nuremberg, uh, and uh, he, he went abroad uh, relatively young. Uh, got his most of his uh, education in, in the U.S. system. Uh, I, I don't think that in, 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 uh, in politically. Uh, in, in, in politics, uh, th th there was an influence uh, from from continent, from Germany, or any any European sources, uh, because the, as far as I know it, uh, as far as I recognize the uh, discussions in the early 20th century, or early first half of the 20th century, there was still this uh, the debate. Uh, from, from World War I about uh, isolationism and, and uh, internationalism. Uh, and this was something completely different than any, any European debates. Uh, because uh, at this time, the Europeans uh, saw more or less along the lines of nation state uh, and nationalism. Uh, and uh, foreign policy was primarily uh, a nation state policy. Uh, and there wasn't much. So you, you can add uh, uh, some, some interesting remarks, particular German uh, thinkers. For example, Max Weber uh, was a highly, uh, very, very strong nationalist. Yeah? Uh, a nationalist to a degree we wouldn't accept today. And if you put Weber, in today's German political arena, he would uh, uh, have no uh, recognition for his particular view strengthening Germany. Or no German politician uh, can, can strengthen Germany, at least verbally, uh, 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 to, today. Uh, so, uh, My, my, my problem with answering is that my main answer would be uh, you, you have to look at particular cases uh, and go into the details and then you will mostly see uh, that it was in most cases uh, an uh, exchange in both ways. Uh, so uh, in, in psychology the development of the behaviorism wasn't not only done in, in the US. It, uh, has some uh, eco or even some, some further uh, earlier developments in, in uh, Europe. Uh, and in, in, in the 1950s, uh, this re realistic uh, approach in political, in international relations, in uh, political theory, uh, was relatively strongly influenced by, by Morgenthau, Hans Morgenthau. Uh, which was of German origin, uh, and probably he sought a little bit of uh, a, a long German lines. Uh, but taking uh, international relations uh, as a social fact and not as a morally uh, disputed uh, area wasn't really strongly a German uh, version of thinking. But what does develop? In particular, this. Uh, but I think in the sociology, if you look at the American Journal of Sociology early issues, you will see you know, articles on Kuntonitz, on Ratzenhofer, I mean, this is brought again, German speaking, more Austrian. And, 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 uh, you know, and they were considered to be authorities on the same level as Weber, although yeah. to, today they are completely forgotten. Uh, and, and this was also part of that kind of particular way of understanding the world, you know. Okay, so, 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 so uh, I think completely that nowadays uh, everything is forgotten, which is older than 20 years, so even past is forgotten nowadays. Uh, 
uh, in, in the American sociology, I would say, more or less, for an average American sociologist, is an unknown man. Uh, but uh, again, uh, <coughs> it's an interesting uh, thing that uh, Georg Simmel's early essays have been translated and appeared in the American Journal relatively early. And he influenced uh, uh, the, the Chicago School. Uh, whereas uh, the influence of, of Weber came partly by Parsons, uh, but very indirectly, uh, uh, partly by some of these refugees, uh, so the, all these uh, Germans uh, who taught at the New School in, in uh, New York uh, thought that they brought some, some uh, Weberian perspective. But finally, the, the strongest influence, I would say, was, was Mills uh, and Gerd's uh, reader. Uh, and if you read this version of Weber, it doesn't have anything to do with uh, the original Weber, uh, because it was a highly edited uh, Weber, uh, but a highly accessible Weber. Yeah? Uh, so, uh, in, 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 in sociology, uh, you can say that uh, Everett Hughes, uh, a quintessential uh, Chicagoan sociologist, got a lot of ideas uh, because he was a reading German. Uh, and he, he lived uh, in Germany in the, in the 1930s as one of these exchange students. Uh, and uh, he returned as one of the yeah, earliest, uh, even the first one in an exchange program between Chicago and Frankfurt in uh, 1947, uh, when he went back to Germany. Uh, and uh, do you know Everett Hughes? Everett Hughes is one of these uh, uh, field researchers. He always scribbled down field notes. Uh, and then he decided uh, he did all his work, and there's no need to publish uh, anything out of it. But, uh, from these uh, experiences in, in Frankfurt, he was uh, he, he had the idea to publish a book <coughs> on uh, how the Germans uh, uh, came uh, uh, to uh, yeah how they, they, how they handled uh, their, their, their Nazi past. Uh, this was of interest for him. Uh, but the uh, University of uh, Chicago Press uh, said no, we are not interested in this particular book. And so there are some chapters uh, really written. And then he reformulated it uh, in a very short uh, piece uh, which appeared uh, as an article in the 1960s uh, on uh, good people and dirty work, which is one of the most impressive uh, short analysis uh, of totalitarian societies. Uh, and so how, how much influence from what side uh, can you say it? Uh, so I would like to suggest that uh, not to talk about influences uh, as a kind of push and pull so, or like, like billiard uh, uh, play where you can determine what's going on if you uh, push uh, the role uh, and reconstruct particular cases. And what I mentioned earlier are just indications of rough abstracts for such reconstructions. 